What's up party people? It's Brad Large back with you again. I get blown away by the different sections in uh, gospel, uh, the different things that are happening. I just think it's fantastic. So in the third, th third discourse is chapter 13. And Jesus has a lot of parables, a lot of teaching. And we wrapped up all the parables in the last video uh, with new and old treasures. And he's trying, you know, Jesus is giving an illustration of how we take treasures from the old and the new. And we, we you know, uh, he says the kingdom of heaven is like a master of a house who brings out of his treasure what is new and what is old. So it's taking all of this and making a master feast, a master community out of all the goodness and the law of the Old Testament and the revelation and the redemption and the redeeming power of the Messiah in the New Testament and the growth of the church in the New Testament. After all the parables, it says, And when Jesus had finished these parables, he went away from there. And coming to his hometown, he taught them in their synagogue. So that they were astonished and said, where did this man get this wisdom and these mighty works? Is not this the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary? And are not his brothers James and Joseph and Simon and Judas? And are not all his sisters with us? Where then did this man get all these things? And they took offense at him. But Jesus said to them, a prophet is not without honor, except in his, own, except in his hometown, in his, in his own household. He did not do many mighty works there because of their unbelief. And that's one crazy way to, end, you know, end the chapter. So Jesus has been teaching and teaching and teaching, and he's saying all these wise things, and people are responding and, and doing this. And he goes home, and they're like, we know you. You're Jesus. Your family's right over there. Where'd you get this authority? Where'd you get this? So I think it's an interesting, again, Matthew, very Jewish gospel. And his audience, when he goes home, I mean, he's, he's teaching them on their home turf. He's going back to where he started. And the people don't accept it. There's an interesting thing that Joseph Campbell talks about in The Hero's Journey. Uh, I'm a big nerd. I read a lot of this stuff. You know, I like Jordan Peterson and Jonathan Peugeot and Joseph Campbell and The Hero's Journey and all these different things. I think there's a little bit uh, we can apply some of it, but we should let our views of the Bible influence how we read these other things. But in the hero's journey, we see this. And the hero's journey, they leave, they get wisdom, and just like Jesus, where did, where did he get his understanding? But when they come home, they bring a gift. And oftentimes, when they come home, there's some resistance, but then they're able to offer the gift up. And we actually have that here in this story. Jesus is also going to redeem the people in Nazareth. His redemption is for everybody. His gift is for everybody, right? Not everybody will take advantage of it, but it's for everyone. And what do they do? They reject him. They reject his gift. So in the hero's journey, like Odysseus comes home and he clears out his house and he makes everything right with his son and his wife and all of this and everything's hunky-dory. He brings back all the treasures from his journeys, right? Jesus is bringing back the treasures of his ministry, and the people are rejecting that. I just thought that was a fantastic little aside. And I, I don't really know what to do with that or how to incorporate it. But that sprung up while I was reading this. Like if we look at it from the hero's journey, it's, it's not exactly like the world tells us the hero's journey should be. Or what, you know, tribal myths and all these things add up to. This is a little bit different. I like what he responds, right? He was, a prophet is not without honor except in his home, hometown and in his own household. Sometimes we feel like we aren't appreciated by the people we want approval from. Right, there are multiple layers to this. And I'm going to try to take this from individual out through global. So sometimes Jesus gets home and people reject his message. And sometimes we feel that way with people we're close to, uh, especially if you've grown up in a church. I think that this could be a difficult thing. I grew up in one church and I, um, I lost the church in the divorce, right? So I don't go to that church anymore. I go to a new church. I don't have baggage from the previous church, but I also don't have the relationships that I had growing up. So there's a trade-off there. Jesus is going home at this point, right? So these are the people that he would have grown up with, would have been around, would have done. Sometimes we, we really feel like we're not appreciated by these people that we grew up around, that, that should know us the best, that don't, they don't necessarily see our growth in the same way. 
Sometimes we have something to offer and people, people around us don't recognize it, right? Like professionally, personally, sometimes you do, you are growing. And sometimes you realize you're growing. The people around you aren't necessarily growing at the same rate you are at this point in your life. And so it can be frustrating because you're like, how do you guys not recognize? Like I'm trying to help or I'm trying to be a certain way and you're treating me like it's an old pattern. You're treating me by my old patterns of behavior, not welcoming this change that I'm trying to embody. I think the next level out like that I wanted to bring up about this is Jesus comes to his hometown. If anybody, like later on, what's interesting about this, his family, does his family speak up for him? Nope. They don't say, hey, you guys should really pay attention here. There's none of that. And if, if they did, it's not in here. But later on, James, Judas, like they write New Testament books. They proclaim Jesus as Messiah. Think about what it would take to get your siblings to pl- proclaim you as a Messiah. Now, if you're the favorite, maybe your mom or dad would, but your siblings aren't. And so I thought that was kind of interesting. Jesus is not going to be accepted by everyone. Sometimes even by people who think they know him the best, they might have a nasty surprise when it comes the day of judgment or it comes that the time of reckoning. That could be a difficult thing. That's, I mean, that's crazy to think about. Sometimes the people that should know us the best are the ones that reject us. Jesus is not immune to that. Not everybody's going to accept him. The parables that he just talked about, there were people who wanted to accept him but couldn't. There were people that outright rejected him. And you see this all around you in our modern day and age. Lastly, Jesus came to save and heal everyone, right? And gives us what we need, not what we want. He wasn't afraid to speak the truth. He could have tried to, oh guys, come on, you know me, Jesus. Just listen to this again. What does he do? He rebukes them. He admonishes them. He says, a prophet is not without honor except in his hometown and in his own household. He calls the situation like he sees it. He doesn't sugarcoat it. He doesn't, he doesn't try to love his way out of the situation. He calls it like it is. Now, he has, Jesus is the son of God. He understands the impact of his words, right? I'm not saying go around and be brash and just speak your truth, right? That's another type of sin because we're not the son of God. So there's a humility and respect that we should uh, roll with there. But he did not do many mighty works there because of their unbelief. That's just sad for me that the place that nurtured Jesus and brought him up, right? That his hometown rejects him. And because of that, they don't get to see the fruit of that. That's just a big lesson. It's a lot to chew on there. But that's where I'm going to leave it for now. I think there are implications for Jesus' ministry and and different things that come out of this, right? And like how we understand his ministry, I guess we should say. But the fact that sometimes the people that are most familiar with us kind of miss who we are or what we have to offer them. And I was actually talking with somebody who's, you know, has a family member that is living a life of sin and they, they see it and they want to correct it, they want to help, they love this person so much, but they're terrified that if they speak the truth that they'll be separated from that family member. This is a very common thing in Christianity. And I think it's why Jesus says, if you really love other people, you're gonna love me first. You're gonna love God first. It's a very difficult thing to do and it's counterintuitive. We, we think, oh, but if I just, if I don't tell them the truth, if I, well, you're also not loving them the way that Jesus exemplified and that God calls us to love people if you're not speaking the truth. That doesn't have to be harshly. It doesn't have to be with animosity. It should not be with animosity or harsh, actually. But we're still called to speak the truth. To not compromise ourselves with truth and love. To strive for God's perfect standard of love. So that's where I'm going to leave it. We're done with chapter 13. So we're headed on to chapter 14 next. I really like that. If you have any standout things that happen during this, as you know, put them in the comments below. Get a conversation started. That'd be great. Like and subscribe to these videos. I would love to see you like and subscribe to these videos. It really helps me stay motivated and keep these things coming out. And uh, if they're providing you value, then I, I'm just, that's what I'm praying for. That people are being you know, reinvigorated to read God's word, to dig into it, to ask questions, to find people, like-minded people to talk about the Bible with. That's partly why I want to do this as a community. So anyways, like and subscribe. I will catch you soon in the next video. Peace.